Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar titled Remote Online Notarizations and E-Signatures, Best Practices and Limitations. Today's webinar is being brought to you by the Florida Bar's Standing Committee on Technology and Legal Fuel, the Practice Resource Center of the Florida Bar. This webinar is part of our series of webinars that we're hosting in conjunction with the Standing Committee on Technology, which will lead up to our all-day technology seminar being held in conjunction with the annual Florida Bar Convention in June. The details of this all-day technology seminar will be posted on the Florida Bar's website as well as legalfuel.com in the coming days and weeks, so please continue to look for those updates and you'll be able to register through there. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. We'll be recording this webinar and we'll share the link after the event. The recording and any supporting resources will also be posted to our website, legalfuel.com. Any questions you may have during today's presentation can be asked through the Q&A feature, which you'll find down at the bottom of your Zoom control panel. Our presenters will do the best to answer any questions you have. However, due to time constraints, they may not be able to address them all. Today's presentation has been approved by the Florida Bar for one hour of general CLE credit, including one hour of technology. The course number for today's presentation is 4770. I would now like to introduce today's presenters. Olga Gallanter is a founding partner of Subrosa Law, a boutique business tax and estate planning firm. She focuses her practice on the issues of high net worth and international estate planning and pre-investment planning. Olga routinely advises clients on business and corporate issues, tax implications of investments in the US by foreign nationals and works with families on tax optimization of existing investments. She is a graduate of both Far Eastern National University Law School in Russia with honors and University of Miami Law, magnum cum laude. Olga received her master's degree in estate planning from the University of Miami Graduate School of Law. William Gamble has been a lawyer for over 40 years. He practiced law in the areas of tax, securities, and banking. He has written three books on law and economics in emerging markets, as well as many articles for journals all over the world. He has spoken to CFA chapters in 15 countries in many US cities. Presently, he is a consultant with IT Governance USA, helping companies institute robust and compliant cybersecurity and privacy systems. He holds four IT certifications, including one of the most advanced, as well as certifications for the GDPR and ISO 27001 cybersecurity standard. I'd now like to hand it over to Olga and William and enjoy the presentation. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Uh, before we get started, I want to preface this presentation with uh, some words of wisdom. Uh, even though this presentation is on e-signatures and online notarizations, I'm not necessarily a proponent of those tools in all circumstances. There are certainly uh, some things that are uh, to be addressed. And what's one of the most important things for you to consider personally is that uh, you should not try to implement those in your practice just because somebody else is doing it. So it's important to understand that there are no prizes for the most technologically advanced uh, setup of your law practice. Uh, you should not uh, create overwhelm for yourself. And if there are tried and true methods that you're using and you're comfortable using, you should continue to use them. Nobody is getting rid of the old school methods of executing documents. So with that, I guess, forward, we can get started with the presentation. So the signature in general, we should consider what that means. What is a signature? Signature is evidence that authenticates writing. Signature is not part of the document itself. It doesn't contain anything, uh, any information of its own, but it does create legal significance, right? So it, it proves that a person, theoretically speaking, proves that a person has signed uh, that writing and confirmed or consented to the terms of that writing. And the notaries, we use notaries as independent third parties, uh, impartial third parties, they're unbiased witness. And in some circumstances, they create evidence, prima facie evidence, which can matter in some circumstances because the burden of proof, for example, may shift from one party to another based on the fact that the writing was notarized. So um, in theory, uh, the laws um, were drafted or the concept of notary exists. Uh, part of it is to defer fraud. So we have this, you know, independent person who can confirm the authenticity 
of somebody's writing so that if somebody accepts writing that was notarized, they don't no longer have to question the authenticity. So at least in theory, the, these were the, the reasons why uh, we have notaries. We have uh, two layers of laws that apply. Uh, one layer is the federal legislation is uh, dated 2000, so it's relatively recent in the grand scheme of things. Of course, as far as technology goes, everything is very rapidly changing. Uh, but generally speaking, we do have a framework, and uh, that framework applies to most of the e-signature methods that you may be using in your practice. Uh, you know, the uh, DocuSign and anything similar would be operating under that law. And it is uh, the, abil the ability of the party to elect e-signature as a method is a choice of the party. So if everybody consents, we are able to use e-signatures to uh, sign our name to a document. And uh, as long as everybody consents to that, just because it's done in a digital format is not a basis to invalidate the document. So this is the general idea that we can use electronic methods to apply our signature in lieu of the physical signature. We also have Uniform and Electronic Transactions Act, which uh, is a part of the Florida uh, statutes. And electronic signature uh, was in the past, it was defined as a signature that's el applied electronically. Under the reiteration that's currently in force, electronic signature is a sound symbol or a process attached to or logically associated with the record. So it's a more broad uh, definition of what an electronic signature would mean under the statute. And there are a couple of things that are uh, obvious, but I would like to mention uh, here. Uh, just because you have something in a digital format doesn't mean that it falls under the statute. For example, if you have a document that was signed in a traditional way, but then it was copied and, and digitized in some way, scanned, uh, it's not really a electronic signature. It's, that document is not electronically signed within the meaning of the statute. So the standard to prove the validity of the document or its contents would be the traditional uh, signature. The laws uh, would apply to the traditional document. And uh, again, why it matters for us um, is a lot of times the enforcing party who's trying to enforce the contract has the burden of establishing that the person against whom we're trying to enforce it has in fact applied their signature to the document. So when you're trying to determine whether you have the proof, be mindful of a digital copy of a document versus electronically signed document. Again, it's something that may be obvious, but worth mentioning. The notary law, the framework, generally speaking. So we have a person who has the uh, responsibility of making sure the person who's signing the document is in fact signing the document, right? So we have pattern uh, where we need to authenticate the signer to the notary. When we were doing this in person, the person typically would produce the ID. When we have an online notarization, typically you have to show your ID, maybe you have to submit your ID ahead of time, but typically you also have to have uh, some form of authentication while you're in the remote notary session. And we'll talk a little bit about uh, what that may look like. The platforms may choose different methods and those are slightly evolving and developing, uh, I guess, additional procedures for ease, for example. But remote online notarization has to comply with several requirements. You know, I'm not going to restate the law, but it is something that has to be recorded in a two-way video and audio uh, conferencing uh, software. So some notaries use, uh, you know, your typical platforms such as Zoom, and then they are able to record it and then store it through the software that they use on their back end to manage their practice. Some have their own proprietary software that they will use for this two-way audio and video conferencing session. So uh, the, the important thing is uh, to remember is that you may have more uh, logistical issues with an online notary session than you would with a traditional notary session. And this is something that I've encountered and in my practice, and that's something that caught me by surprise. 
But for some reason, you know, clients, even those who typically don't have any issues using technology on the day that, that they're supposed to appear and, you know, the window that we have for them, they, for some reason, completely forget how to use their technology or they're caught off guard that they have to produce their ID or confirm their identity or the way that the session is being recorded and, you know, they're feeling a little bit off base for some reason. So this has been, uh, sometimes it's very easy and it's very smooth. And sometimes that additional layer of technology uh, can be intimidating potentially to the client. So, uh, but the notary does have to go through a separate course and they have to qualify to become a remote uh, notary. So this is not just any notary who's licensed, uh, who has the uh, commission of a notary recording a session that they uh, witness uh, somebody sign, this is not going to comply with the statute for remote online notarizations. They actually have to use specific software and they have to comply with the procedures and they have to have that specific course and license to be the remote online notary. So uh, with that, we can uh, talk about what that session typically would look like. Um, usually you would upload your documents or you share them ahead of time because notary typically has to tag the document appropriately for the appropriate parties. So they would assign a specific box for a signature for a specific person within the document. And if there's multiple parties, that there's just that's just more work for them to tag that document throughout. Once they send the document to the parties, those tags would actually limit the signer to that specific box and not allow them to sign elsewhere. This, can, this is great because they can't really sign where they're not supposed to sign, but if the notary either forgot to tag or maybe the attorney didn't communicate that a specific window has to be tagged or something we realized last minute, there is no way for us to do that on the spot. We have to potentially back out of that session, re-upload the document, let the notary do their job, and then re-enter the session again and start it from the beginning. So this is some, this is the preparation part. Then during the session, whoever signs the document has to authenticate that they are who say who they say they are. They produce their ID, they you know place it next to their face. And there's also potentially a uh, authentication that's based on the knowledge uh, of the signer. So we'll we'll talk about the issues with that. Uh, usually they use a social security um, uh, number and the credit history database to authenticate uh, the individual. So they need to be prepared to answer some questions or they need to be prepared to uh, for the notary to ask them questions. In my practice, we have something that's called a vulnerable adult. I do primarily wills, trusts, and estates. So we have something that's considered a vulnerable adult. Uh, co concept. A vulnerable adult um, is a person who is limited in their abilities or depends on someone is not able to take care of themselves for uh, either due to mental uh, limitations, physical limitations, or just day-to-day -day tasks. So that vulnerable adult would not be able to use the remote online notary session to execute their documents. When I'm signing the will, whether I have vulnerable adults involved or not, the person actually has to answer those questions and confirm to the notary that no, I don't have any issues taking care of my affairs. I don't have any problems uh, managing um, my daily tasks and things like that. So clients may be surprised if the notary is asking them those questions because that's not something that's typically would be asked of them if they were in a traditional notary session. So prepping the client is important and probably more important because, you know, the clients are a little bit uneasy about it to start with. Some absolutely love it and they're embracing it and some may be a little uncomfortable. So just preparing them, the types of questions they may be asked, the authentication process is a little bit more involved. Um, and the fact that the notary session will be recorded and becomes a part of the executed documents. That's also something that I recommend letting your clients know so they're aware. So as far as the limitations, right? So what would be the reason why we would not want to use either e-signatures or uh, remote notaries, online notarization? 
there could be actual legal limitations. For example, I've already brought up the issues with wills, trusts, and estates. In order to execute a will, you cannot be a vulnerable adult. If you're a vulnerable adult, remote online notarization or electronic signature is not available to you. It's simply not something that would be valid. Another issue that I've encountered in my practice, and I do work with a fair amount of foreign nationals, foreign governments are very reluctant to accept those documents. They are not bound by a full faith and credit clause that, uh, you know, the exchange between states is a little bit easier. Um, but even if the document is properly notarized in a number of you know, states in the United States, uh, remote notaries have been available for quite some time. But those documents, even if they're properly notarized, they would not be accepted in that foreign country. So I do have to go through the more traditional methods uh, because there's just not as much faith. Even though ironically, right, we do have a lot more evidence or record oftentimes with a digital signature than we do with a traditional signature that that in fact was the person who signed this document and this is a valid signature. So there is this irony, in my opinion, that people are not trusting the digitally signed or notarized documents as much as they do the old school or wet ink uh, signed documents. So I always found it interesting, that dichotomy. We do also have to remember that the parties are not required to consent to the uh, e-signature, for example, right? So if a contract is signed between the parties, one of the parties may say, no, I don't, I don't want that document to be signed electronically. I want wet ink. And they are, um, they're not bound by law to have to uh, do uh, e-signature. So they could elect out of that. And uh, we have, uh, you know, some mistrust, right? So, and that's evident when you're dealing with government agencies or foreign governments, you know, can we actually trust the document? You know, yes, in theory, there's a lot more evidence that this is the person who in fact signed the document and these are the authentic, uh, this is the authentic signature of the signer. But we also have concerns. What if somebody created the signature and it wasn't the signer? What kind of evidence do we have? What if somebody in bad faith actually modifies that if we have some kind of a digital error or a ransomware or there's a malfunction, we have um, potentially a document going to the wrong place, it's being sent to the wrong place, um, somebody is misusing somebody's login credentials, you know, somebody logged in the computer and signed it on their behalf where the person we're trying to enforce the contract against never actually signed that document. So we have a number of uh, those things that people tend to be concerned about. Again, in most circumstances, we have a lot more evidence with a digital document. And on the technical side, I'm certainly not an expert and I will let William elaborate on the types of e-signatures that we have available and the types of, I guess, technology uh, that goes into it and the uh, metadata that is created as part of the digital record when the document is signed. So I'm not going to go into as much detail on that because that's more of a Williams uh, part of the presentation, the more technical part. So the challenges. Um, in my personal opinion, the remote notary is more complicated and takes up more of my personal time than a traditionally signed document. In the traditional setting, it's extra two minutes of my time, if that. With a remote notary, we kind of have to go over the documents ahead of time. We cannot really do it while the notary is there on the audio video uh, conferencing uh, software with us because the notary is right there. So the client doesn't want to talk about the things um, that they would naturally want to talk to me about or confirm before signing the document. So um, the, uh, you know, you kind of have to go through the document ahead of time, deliver it to the uh, notary ahead of time and make sure that it's properly tagged. Uh, I've had clients provide the notary with email without realizing that that email is associated with a specific device and they don't actually have that device on them. It's someplace else. So it's, it's they're, they're trying to use it from the iPad and they've never linked that particular work email to their personal iPad. 
So we have to <laughs> restart from the beginning because the document went to the email that they don't have access to. Um, sometimes the clients will be on video and all you can see is their forehead, right? So they're, they're looking down at the screen and all you can see is the forehead. And maybe they uh, occasionally lift their head enough for us to see who that is, but we can't see who that, that it is, the, in fact, this person throughout the entire session. Or maybe they're completely off screen. Maybe during the session, we realize that somebody else is in the room with them. And you know, you see all of a sudden, you see a third hand across the screen who's helping the client click through the remote notary session. And basically, uh, yes, at the direction of the client, apply signature, digital signature to the document. So in of itself, that may actually not be a problem if it's done at the direction of the client, but this is something that may need to be disclosed so that it's part of that digital record of that session, that this, this occurred, somebody else was assisting the client with actual technology piece or applying the signature on their behalf. In one of my cases recently, um, we actually were at a disadvantage because we could not prove um, to uh, judge's satisfaction that this technology is not something client is comfortable using or able to use. It's an elderly client with a flip phone who is uh, uh, not mobile. And they we could not produce that witness in time uh, so we had to use a backup option or try to procure other witnesses uh, to prove a document. So the assumption that technology is readily available is something that you may need to overcome in your practice and you need to be prepared for that. With and specifically to uh, estate planning, this is uh, something that I've already mentioned, uh, vulnerable adult, uh, you cannot do a, a no electronic will. This is not something that's available to you. So to me, again, the irony, this uh, medium is meant to help people who are not mobile or maybe don't have the access to um, uh, the attorney in their jurisdiction. And it tends to be those very same people would probably fall under vulnerable adult statute because of their immobility. So the, the statute is meant to help, you know, with the availability, make it more available, make sure that more people have um, access to this uh, uh, technology and are able, able to use the technology to, for example, sign a will. But the very same people are the ones who are excluded by the statute. So it's that balance that I understand um, we're trying to strike to protect the vulnerable adults. But at the same time, I think it goes against uh, pretty much everything that the statute was uh, trying to accomplish in the first place. So the, the one thing, again, I have encountered in my experience with the clients, they try to, you know, you, they prepared, they're, they're, you know, ready to go, and they try to answer the questions that the notary asks to um, uh, prove their identity. And this is called dynamic knowledge-based authentication. These are the types of questions you may know, uh, for example, have you lived on any of the following streets? What was the last charge on your card? Or what was the amount of the charge on April 19? and questions of that nature. So the issue is that maybe that information is available and it's something they can pull together, but a lot of times there is that cap of time. They have to answer a number of questions within two minutes. And I've had a client say, I, I don't remember. These are, and they can go as far back as 20 years. So those questions can go quite a while back. The client may simply not remember, especially if they move around a lot or they own a lot of properties or they operate a lot of businesses. <laughs> they may not actually have that information available, uh, readily available, or they can't recall. So I've had clients fail that authentication. It means we can't proceed unless there is another option for us to use to authenticate the client, we're simply not able, not able to proceed. So that's an issue for you to be aware of as a practitioner, have a backup plan if you need a backup plan or make sure the client is properly practiced to what they may need to do during the session. So uh, in estate planning, one of the issues that we encounter is we have to have two witnesses and a notary typically for the document to be valid. These are the formalities of a will. 
and they have to be present in front of each other and sign the document basically at the same time. So that means I have to pull everybody into the session at the same time. And that's typically not an issue, that's fine, but if one person has the avail uh, technology available, the other person does not, I cannot piecemeal this process. I have, to, it's either uh, all or nothing, right? It's unless the document can be signed in counterparts and we don't have to all be together at the same time, this can be a hurdle as well. Um, all right, so practical considerations. Um, I will wrap up my portion of the presentation before we uh, move on to uh, William's uh, portion. Practical considerations, again, prep the client, make sure they understand what that's going to look like. If this is your first time, usually you will receive instructions by email ahead of time. You can read those instructions and then make sure the clients are either read those instructions or try to explain to them what's going to be expected of them. They are not going to read the email they received from the notary until the time uh, that, that they need to actually log in. Uh, please ensure that the technology they're going to use, if you, if you have the ability to do that, is going to be compatible with the software being used. Is the screen going to be so small that they won't be able to see anything? Or is this the email that's associated with this device? Um, an issue for me is the client's ability to understand the notary. Uh, and uh, on the platforms, typically the notary uh, will have a requirement that the platform itself generates. So even if that's not something required by the statute, the platform may require the notary to have that uh, standard in place. But if the person uh, does not speak English as their first language or don't speak enough to understand without somebody else's assistance, somebody has to translate the communication between the signer and the notary, uh, the notary will require the document to be translated in the client's native language. This is absolutely something that would not be required in a traditional uh, notary session. So, you know, the client, all they, all we're trying to see is, is did the client willingly sign this document? Do they understand what they're signing? And we don't really have to have the document in that second language. And this can be very pricey to get that notary, uh, to, to get that requirement satisfied. If the document is lengthy and we have to translate it ahead of time. So um, the, the translation to me uh, can become a hurdle uh, in order to be able to use the a particular platform, for example. The uh, remote online notary may not be available to a client who does not have a social security number or credit history because this is how the client is being authenticated. Unless there is another option for them to use to authenticate the client, maybe it's possible the notary actually personally knows the signer. That's, that's another option, right? So now we don't no longer have to authenticate using that method. Sometimes we are able to submit a statement to the notary that we personally know the signer and we guarantee to the notary that this is the correct person or the person who they, they say they are. So um, I think that concludes my uh, practical considerations um, uh, portion. And I think, yes, so we are moving on to uh, William's piece. I think there will be a little bit of time at the end of the session to answer any questions. And um, my content, content information is at the end of the presentation as well. I'm more than happy to answer any questions. I've done a great number of these things at this point. And this presentation was uh, sort of born out of the wish to help other practitioners go through this process with uh, less of growing pains uh, than, than I did in, um, during the past year. So. Uh, with that, I would like to hand it over to William. Thank you, Olga. Anyway, <clears throat> so I'm the geek in this, this crowd. Um, I don't talk to lawyers. All I do is talk to uh, IT guys and, um, and, and girls, but all, the, all different types of people who basically do this all day. <clears throat> and I also want to say, um, FYI, uh, you can hack anything. So, and, and the hackers, are truly admirable because they're exceptionally imaginative in how they do it. So these are basically the three types of um, electronic signatures that are allowed under various laws. Uh, in the United States, we basically have the uh, 
the basic electronic signature and the advanced uh, electronic digital signature. And basically what you do in cybersecurity is you try to protect confidentiality, availability, and integrity. And with the other layer on top of this is making sure that you get involved in uh, authenticity. Because remember everything, that, that Olga had that lovely list of things that can go wrong. And all that stuff uh, is easily is, you know, it, it comes from different things. For example, the concept of authentication. Anybody that she was talking about the, the two methods of authentication. When one's dynamic, you ask so many questions, and the other static, you say, What's your social security number? Well, social security numbers are available on the black on the dark web for about a buck a, a number. Um, and in terms of the other information, in terms of the dynamic information, there's a whole area that is used by hackers for uh, and you know, pen testers, ethical hackers, which is called open source um, uh, intelligence, or uh, there's actually, uh, it's OINT is the name for it. So when, if someone is really wants to break into one of these things, that's the type of information and stuff that they're going, that they possibly can use. The different levels here are the simple advance and the, and the QES. Now the QES is only available in Europe uh, and it's a different layer. Next slide. Oh, okay. This is how uh, an AES is designed. This is called in the world, this is called the PKI infrastructure or X.509 for you people who really have problems. Uh, anyway, every time you see this, when you see this little lock there, if you've ever seen that when you go to your banking website, this is HTTPS. And HTTPS means that what you have is what you do is you get a uh, exchange of, of, of certifications, uh, of certificates. And there are, what there are, are trusted third parties in this, in this entire process. And what happens in the process, which is, is rather ungainly, uh, it involves what's called uh, asymmetrical uh, cryptography in which one party has a public key and the other has a private key and you create a document using your private key and then you send it to somebody who is asked for it and they decrypt it with, their, with your public key. And that's what all these certificates are. This is an example of a certificate. And you find these things out by clicking, clicking the little lock and all these cool things show up and it shows where your public key is and what the cryptography is, and it shows where you get your certificates. Now, the way this comes in for a notary is what happens when you log in, the notary has a specific uh, a, a certificate that they get and only they can get. Uh, and that certificate is what they, how you authenticate to something. So they, you get the certificate that when you log in and then actually you can use that certificate to get an encrypted key and you use that encrypted key to compare it to the certificate key with a hash, an algorithm. A hash is just an algorithm that is used to mathematically calculate what's in a document. And that way you tell, okay, I'm William Gamble, I can do this and I know that uh, I'm looking at a specific website. And so when you go to the notary website, what you're doing is you're using the notary as for a third party authentication. But the public key infrastructure is goes runs throughout the entire system. It's not just for uh, it's not just for um, it's not just for uh, e notaries. That's basically everything. And by the way, we're eventually going. To, a lot of the browsers won't look at the old style system pretty soon. So make sure you're up to date. Okay, next next slide, please. Okay, this is another example of how this whole thing works is what happens is the signer goes on and they and they create a document. And then that, get, that gets hashed and then that gets encrypted with a private key. So we have an encrypted digitally documented sign. And then it goes out into this thing. This thing in our business is called the wild because it's, it's what's called an untrusted network where anything and anything can and does happen. And when it gets down here, what you do is you decrypt it with the, with the public key here, which you got from the certificate. 
And then that's compared to the hash algorithm. And if that, uh, if those hash values actually look the same, then you know that the proper person has signed the document. Of course, uh, a lot of stuff ha can happen around here and also in terms of the certifications and, and various types of things can happen, especially in terms of uh, the videos and all sorts of stuff like that. Okay, the next one, please. Okay, there. We're to start out with the, the SES, the SES, the simple e-signature, and that is again goes. That's the uh, the the first law that we saw, uh, and that is um, again it's logically or associated with with some particular document, and that's not meaning that it's bad. I mean, there are certain types of things that if there's not a lot of money at stake, uh, then you can use that. The problem is it's easy to forge. The thing is about signatures and what level of signatures you want to look at and also what level of cybersecurity you want to use for anything. As I tell my delegates, uh, what's the, one of the first things you have to look at is all information is not created equal. There is some information, at least according to Facebook, that is always, it's out there, you, it's, you know, and it doesn't really make any difference. Like it's very easy to find my name my telephone number, my address, for example, uh, in any very simple search. Um, more in-depth searches are also possible and you can actually do those. Uh, but the, some of this information is, is not as interesting. And what you look at is what is easy to monetize in terms of uh, the information involved. So for example, a residential lease agreement might not be easy to monetize. So as a result, you can use a lesser degree of signature in order to, to put that up to, to, uh, to finish the, uh, the transaction, because that's not employment contracts. That's, it's not, you know, it, it was, we pretty well know when we employ somebody that, that it's the one person showing up, unless there is something out there that can be filched, it's not a, it may not be a really big deal. Procurement document sales, that type of commercial agreements might be at a different layer because a commercial agreement might have certain uh, payment terms, which uh, are always very nice to see for a hacker. You always want, I mean, under certain circumstances, if your uh, C CEO was unwise enough to say that they're going on vacation, you can almost guarantee that on uh, that Friday afternoon that the controller will get an email stating that uh, a specific vendor is owed a certain amount of money. And by the way, they changed their bank account number. So, um, and so you email the information to the wrong people. But in certain circumstances, you really, really have to think about the data you're dealing with and the transaction you're dealing with and to find out whether it's easy to monetize it or not. Okay, Olga, next. Next slide. Okay, this is the next layer up. Now, um, what this does is this uses starts using the PKI infrastructure. So what we're trying to do here is authenticate something. And what we, we've gotten to the point where we're not sending stuff in, in, over the web in clear text. What we're doing we're, is we're sending stuff that is, um, that is encrypted. Or if you wanna send stuff in clear, in clear text, it might be a better idea to use a secure network so like that's when you're talking about a VPN type of thing where you, you know, it is a secure network that's not available to anybody else. But what this is, is this is because you've encrypted the, the, the key and you've identified the signatory, you have a method of actually creating something that is, shall we more, say, more difficult to hack. Right now for certain types of cryptography, uh, they are unhackable. You cannot brute force them. So that is for most uh, higher level hashes. But uh, the time is coming as we move to quantum uh, computing, where we will get to, we'll have to come up with different methods, especially for asymmetric cryptography. And so the whole infrastructure might be, um, might be in danger here. The whole point of this one is to ensure integrity and availability. Normally, the documents themselves are usually probably 
uh, encrypted with what's called symmetric cryptography. So usually they will, won't leave under certain circumstances. You do have to be careful with these things in terms of when you store them, uh, in any time you mess with a, a bit of uh, on Word or something like that, it could change the, the hash. So we have to be very careful about how you store them and what you do with them. With the difference is with an AES signature, usually the burden of proof is on, is with the signatory. Okay, next slide, please. Next slide. Ah, boom. Okay, this is your highest level. Now, interestingly enough, the uh, QES um, does not exist in the United States. The default here is something similar to what to uh, what Olga was talking about with the online notary system. The difference between an AES and a QES is what they've done is they've inserted an uh, independent third party into the process. And in Europe, what they have is, is they have a directive and this has established this as part of the uh, of of the process. So what you you have created what's called a qualified trust service provider. You think of that as the sort of European notary, and of course, a notary in Europe is totally different. Quite often, a totally different type of things. But there are certain signatures that are managed by these types of people. Quite often, they are the same organizations like uh, DocuSign or something like that. Uh, but what they're doing is they will be the ones who will probably ask the questions. They will, and these can only be done on certain qualified signature creation devices. You cannot, the difference is you can't, you know, uh, do that with your own technology. If you have to contact and of course pay a qualified trust service provider and they will have the, the signature creation devices and they will manage the whole process and they will, you know, provide the protection and things like this. With the PKI infrastructure, how that's done in the United States is usually that's that, that the transfer of certificates is usually not done on your uh, browser. Usually that's done by some company like DocuSign who, who actually uh, works on that. However, I, the, one of the problems I wanna warn you in DocuSign, and I just saw this, is that <clears throat> Uh, we have to remember that hackers are not guys in their parents' basement with hoodies. These people are fabulously rich. They're earning literally $1.5 billion, trillion dollars a year. They can afford any type of the best cybersecurity, the best, you know, uh, you know, the, the best um, coders, the best artists, the best people, website creators. And so they can create something that is totally perfect. Now, 10 years ago, you might have looked at one of these things and said, oh, the English isn't right. These days, it, that's not you know, what it happens. And one of the things I saw recently, which was sort of cute, was a, uh, a, a DocuSign uh, email. And it looked exactly like it came from DocuSign. And it said, by the way, here's your invoice and here's the, and here's the document, please download it. And of course, if you did click on that thing, uh, you would be downloading a, a macro enabled type of thing, which would start downloading malware onto your system. So uh, even though the DocuSign is very good, there are ways, there are various ways to hack this as well. So, um, you know, uh, at some level it, it might, again, as what Olga was talking about, you might, it might be a better idea just to stay with the old school. The difference with the, with the QES under the EU regulation is that the burden of proof shifts, not to the person who made the signatory, but the person who is contesting it. So that's a, a, a big issue for these people. All right, the next slide, please. Okay, Those are, these are some of the US signing services. Uh, all of them, you know, have different costs and DocuSign I probably is the bigger, biggest one, but uh, they all basically are working on the same technology. So some of them have different whistles and bells. What's interesting is that if you go to the websites of these companies in Europe, they all offer the uh, QES, while that is not basically available in the United States. One thing I would like to mention um, one of the things I also do is teach the GDPR and privacy issues are, are a big deal with us, uh, especially after the end of the 
US-EU treaty, the privacy shield which ended last summer. So transfers of information outside of the EU are, can be a real issue. Uh, and right now we are transferring information. Even worse, we're transmitting uh, biometric information. So now we have, we have to worry about the, all the new biometric laws, the Illinois Biometric uh, Information Protection Act, the BIPA, and uh, Article 44 of the GDPR, in addition to the new concept of sensitive information under the California Privacy Rights Act. So when you do do these types of things, uh, yes, it's easy to go on Zoom and do that type of stuff, but in the process, you are risking a dump, much of, of violating some of the other laws and some of the privacy laws around the world. So, uh, and around the world now, there are about 20, 25 other countries that have adopted something like the GDPR. So when you set up some of the process, that's one of the things that you should consider are the privacy indications uh, and other issues. There's another thought here is, so it might be a good idea to get everybody's consent in some way, shape or form uh, before you, you know, start the process because you are gaining access to private information and you're sending it uh, to different places that may require different types of uh, requirements. All right, the next slide, please. Okay, <laughs> I always tell my delegates that I'm a time traveler. I'm from the last century. Uh, and in my century, as Olga pointed out, um, there are other ways to do this. And some ways there are, are, there are, you know, just work better. I mean, for example, Olga was telling me about, you know, if you're a qualified will protector. Well, if you, if someone gives you a will and it's a digital will to keep, um, you know, as soon as you open the file on a Word document, uh, you may change the metadata or the hash of that particular file. So there are certain things you have to be very, very careful of in terms of dealing with, an, you know, a Word document. So the best way to do possibly do with that is to um, put it on e drive and do what we call air gapping. In other words, keep it away from the internet because anything can happen on the internet. But this, you can also get these things that encrypted. Uh, so that might be a way to do it, or you make sure that it's read only. Uh, if, you, if it's read only, then the metadata on the document doesn't change. And by the way, there's a major difference between the metadata on the document and the metadata outside the document. It was stuff, it's like a library card in a book. You change the library card, you don't change the book. But going back and changing the actual document uh, can have some unintended consequence, which may come up uh, in a forensic element and it may, may change various types of aspects to uh, th these various documents. Just because it looks nice doesn't necessarily mean that you're actually gonna get what you think you get. So it's sometimes better just to, you know, have somebody sign it and then we're signed what they call duplicate copies and then keep these in a file uh, away from any online possibility. If it's online or if it's available online, you, that's, you know, in my world, only the paranoid survive. So you have to be very, these technologies are great. They're lots of fun to play with, but each and every one of them has potential downside, uh, which have sort of gotten worse with time. All right, thank you very much. That's, I think that's the end of the slides, Olga. Questions, That's Haley? Right, we're at the end of our slides. Uh, there was one question. Should I should I talk uh, talk through now? Yeah, sure. There was one question. I answered it already. Can remotely notarized document be apostilled? And the answer is yes. One thing to keep in mind, and actually, let me let me back up and explain for those who may not know what um, apostille is. So apostille is done pursuant to the Hague Convention from 1960 or something of that nature. There's a number of member states. Most countries in the world are member states. So it's an agreement between the countries that if something was notarized, there is an agency within that country, within that jurisdiction that can confirm the validity of that notarization and confirm that it was properly done. And that becomes the all everything that the receiving 
state would need to accept that as a truly notarized document as if it was done, for example, the document in Florida was notarized if it has an upper seal, it's, uh, and I'm trying to use it in Germany, the German authorities would accept it as if it was done pursuant to German law. So that's the nature of the upper seal procedure. So uh, what, what's important to remember when upper sealing a document, you have to actually understand where the notary is licensed. Uh, pursuant to which state do we have to uh, use the uh, notarization procedures and the apostille process. So sitting in Broward County in Florida, my client could be in New York and the notary could be in Virginia. So if I'm trying to apostille that document, then I have to do it through the apostille procedures in Virginia. If it's a Florida notary, we submit it to throughout through the Florida procedures. But the short answer is yes. It's a considered a properly notarized document and the state would confirm it. Any other questions? No, I, I don't Roll see any other questions. All right. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. Um, so it was lovely to speak to. All right, thank you very much. If you have any follow-up questions, my contact information is on the screen right now. Happy to answer any practical questions or share in private any of the services that I use. I don't necessarily endorse them, but I'm happy to share everything that I've actually tried out. Thank you both William and Olga for a great presentation. Just remind everybody again that the course number for today was 4770. And if you'd like to watch this uh, presentation again, the recording will be available on legalfuel.com. Thank you and have a great day. Thank you.